What are you reading? Hi, it's the Holy Quran. But isn't the Quran only for Muslims? Not at all. Its teachings are addressed to all humanity, from heads of state to everyday people like us. What does it teach us? It's a book of life for life. No thinking person should pass through life without it. Where can I get a copy? From the IPCI, 124 Queen Street, Durban. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <laughs> إن الله لا يهدي القوم الفاسقين صدق الله صدق الله العظيم. My dear brothers and sisters, I bring to you peace and salutations from the deepest south of Africa. If you look at the map of the continent of Africa, at the southmost point there is a country called South Africa. In that country there live some half a million of your brothers and sisters. On their behalf, I say to you, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My dear brothers and sisters, in this very militant age, when we are hearing about wars and the rumors of wars, about hijackings and kidnappings, about bombings, I have quoted to you one of the most militant verses of the Holy Quran. In this militant age, I have quoted you one of the most militant verses of the Holy Quran. It happens to be from Surah Tawbah. Surah Tawbah. Tawbah means repentance. It happens to be chapter 9 in the Holy Quran. This chapter is one of the most militant chapters in the Quran. What makes me to say that? What makes me to say that? Thank you. You see, this Surah Surah Tawbah is the only chapter in the Holy Quran which begins without a Bismillah. It's an amazing situation that every chapter in the Qur'an begins with the formula Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim in the name of Allah most gracious, most merciful. We start the Qur'an with Surah Fatiha, we say Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar Rahmanir Rahim. We say Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Kula Auzu Birabin Nas, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Kula Auzu Birabil Falak, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Kulhu Allahu Ahad, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Tabbat Yada, Abilah Bi Motab. Every chapter of the Quran begins with this beautiful formula in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Here is a chapter, no Bismillah. It's an amazing thing. Beautiful salutation. Beautiful introduction, but no Bismillah. 
Why is there no Bismillah in that surah? So learned men, our learned men, they tell us that this is Toba, repentance, it is a warning given to the mushiks of Makkah. They had entered into a treaty with the Muslims and unilaterally on their own they broke the treaty. So Allah Ta'ala is giving them a warning. He says, give you three months in, put, in, in which to put things right. Otherwise a declaration of war by Allah and his messenger. War. By the time he reaches verse 3, he says, وَبَشِّرِ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِأَزَابٍ عَلِيمٍ And give glad tidings, give the good news to the kafir of azabin alim, of a grievous penalty. When Allah Bari Ta'ala talks like that, we can see that Bismillah is uncalled for. Similarly as we would do. You know, while we are walking, let's say our wife or daughter is walking ahead of us and somebody snatches a handbag. And you run and you grab, you grab the, the thief. What do you tell him? What would you tell him? He says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Is that what you tell him? I'm a very nice, kind hearted old man. But if you don't return that handbag, I'll break your neck for you. Is that how you talk? No. If it calls for breaking a guy's neck or arm, he says, Hey, give that back or I'll break your neck for you. Am I right? There's no Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's uncalled for. Allah bari ta'ala, that's the same. A declaration of war, warning, ultimatum. When Allah is ultimatum, it goes straight into the subject, he says, look, put things right, or war. It's a very militant surah, most militant in the Holy Quran. But by the time Allah bari ta'ala, in his revelation, he reaches verse 24. He now devotes his attention to us, us. First was it was the mushriks, now it's our turn. It's our turn. He's now focusing his attention on us. He says, Qul, tell them, you, tell these Muslims. Allah is telling one of you, tell them now. That was for the kafirs. Now he says, tell these fellows here. Those people who say that they believe in you, believe in Allah and his message, in his revelation. Tell them. In kana ba'ukum, whether it be your fathers, wa'abna'ukum, or your sons, wa'ikhwanukum, or your brothers, wa'azwajukum, or your wives. Or your relations. Or the wealth that you have amassed. Or the losses you fear in your businesses. And, if, and the dwellings in which you take so much delight. If you love any one of these things more than you love Allah, wa Rasulihi and His Rasul. وَجِهَادٍ in سَبِيلِهِ And doing jihad in Allah's way is a فَتَرَبَّسُ He says, you wait. فَتَرَبَّسُ You wait. حَتَّى يَأْتِيَ اللَّهُ بِأَمْرِهِ Until Allah's decision comes about. For what? For your destruction. حَتَّى يَأْتِيَ اللَّهُ بِأَمْرِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَحْذِ الْقَوْمِ الْفَاسِكِينَ For Allah will not guide a rebellious people, perverted transgressors. He's talking about us. He's not talking about the Mushriks. He's not talking about the Jews. He's not talking about the Nasara. He's talking about us. You, he said, you perverted transgressors, you rebellious people. Allah will not guide you. He will not help you. He says, Fatarabbas, you wait. An amazing situation. The Muslims, they waited. We Muslims. We must misunderstood the message. Allah says, wait, and we waited. For what? 800 years, Allah Bari Ta'ala gave us rule, dominion, power in Spain. In Spain, the Muslims ruled Spain for 800 years. They created a garden, beautiful country. They enjoyed the fruits of this life. But they didn't do the job. They didn't do the job. They didn't propagate the faith. So after 800 years of Muslim rule, they were wiped out to a man. There was not one man left in that country to give the azan. Do you know that? After 800 years, can you imagine the situation that you live and rule a nation for 800 years and you are wiped out to a man, not one man to give the azan. Why? Because you didn't do the job. Allah says, Fatarabbasu, you wait and they waited. Waited for destruction. These Arabs, these were our brothers. Who lives in Spain? They were our brothers. And they were reading the Quran. 
they were reading the Holy Quran and they understood the Quran. Unlike the non-Arabs. 90% of the Muslims of the world are non-Arabs. We read the Quran like a parrot. That's how we were trained to read, like a parrot. We read it for sawab, for blessings, and inshallah Allah will give us sawab. He will reward us. Maybe he'll give us double reward. But unfortunate part is that we don't know what we are reading. We are not getting instructions. These Arabs, they read the Quran in their own mother tongue. They understood what Allah was telling them. And yet they didn't heed the warning. They read in the Quran. He said, how many were the gardens and the fountains they left behind? And cornfields and monumental buildings. And wealth and the amenities of life in which they took so much delight. What is the come? He said, thus other people were made to inherit these things. Neither the heavens nor the earth shed a tear for them, nor was respite given to them anymore. This is the warning Allah gives. How many were the gardens and the fountains they left behind? You go to Spain, the only thing you can see in Spain is the Alhambra, the Granada, whatever forefathers left. You see those monumental buildings. You see the fountains there. You see the fountains there and the gardens laid out by our ancestors. There is nothing else to see in Spain except bullfights. Any other thing to see in Spain is bullfights. You know, you know bullfights. And the castanets. You know the women, when they do their little dances, they do click, 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 you know, they have something in their hands. Besides that, there is nothing in Spain except what our forefathers left. They're reading these verses of the Quran. They're repeating these verses of the Quran, but they are laughing at the Egyptians. People of Iran, you know, how many were the gardens and the fountains they left behind, and cornfields and monumental buildings. <laughs> you see the fools, the Egyptians, they didn't learn. Eight plagues, nine plagues, plagues after plagues, Allah sent to them, destroyed Firaun and his army. <laughs> it's a big laugh, the fools, they didn't hit the warning. They didn't know that they were in the firing line themselves. You are in the firing line. They're laughing at the other fool. This is the nature of man, all of us. We laugh at the other fellow. When we see that it is we who are in the mess, they didn't hit the warning. Allah says, Fatarabbasu. They did Fatarabbasu. Allah says, wait. And they waited. For what? For destruction. And destroy. The Middle East. Under Harun al Rashid, Mahmoud al Rashid, a veritable fairyland. A veritable fairyland. Baghdad, Samarkand, Bukhara. The scenes that existed then, you can't reproduce those scenes anymore except on film. Hollywood is the only one that can do it. In real life, no more. The beauty, the riches, the opulence, no more. You can't produce those things anymore. On the borders with the Mongols, the Tatars, barbarians, we laughed at them, fools, you know, those fools. What can you take, talk to them about Islam? What can they understand about Islam? The Spanish people, the Arabs reason, what can they understand about Islam? Pig eaters. These are all pig eaters. Who? The Spanish people. They are wine bibles, drunkards. What can they understand about Islam? These mongers, barbarians, what can they understand about Islam? This is the mentality. Allah says, Fatah Rabbah. These Muslims are our brothers. They kept nice, nice beards, better than mine. Yes, they prayed five times a day. They read the subah, the tasbih. They went for hajj. They gave zakat. They didn't drink. They didn't gamble. They didn't dance. Wonderful Muslims. Good Muslims. Wallah, they were good Muslims. Perhaps as good as us or better than us. But they didn't propagate the faith. They didn't share the faith with the Mongols, barbarians. What can they understand? I said, your forefathers could. You Arabs? Your forefathers, before Islam, that era we call it Ayyamul Jahiliya, the days of ignorance. No? Ayyamul Jahiliya, the days of ignorance. These Arabs, our ancestors, you know, they married their stepmothers. Did the Spanish people do that? They buried their daughters alive. Did the Mongols do that? Drunkards, adulterers, gamblers fratricidal wars. They made the tawaf around the Kaaba absolutely naked. Men and women, not even a G-string. These white women, they put a G-string. You know that little piece. 
These Arabs, they didn't even have that around the Kaaba. They reasoned very beautifully. They said, what can we present ourselves before Allah that is good enough? They said, so we present ourselves as Allah sent us into the world. Very good logic. They made the tawaf absolutely naked, these Arabs. Allah could transform them through his book, Al-Quran al Karim. With his revelation, he could transform them into a nation of torchbearers and light and learning. He could do that to you, rubbish. You who married your stepmothers, you who buried your daughters alive, he could change you. He can't change the Spanish people? No. He can't change through Allah's kalam the Mongols? No. That's your mentality. Allah says, Fatara Basu, you wait. And they waited. You know, sometimes we misunderstand instructions. Allah says, wait, it doesn't mean wait. It's a warning. Like somebody, a small boy here, 10 year, 12 year old, suppose he's misbehaving and you give him a smack. So he tells you, he says, Uncle, wait, I'll bring my big brother along. And his big brother happens to be the biggest bully, biggest hooligan in Manhattan. You're going to wait for him? You're going to wait for him? <laughs> He's telling you to wait. Uncle, wait. No, that wait doesn't mean wait. He's warning you. He said, look, you wait. Let my brother come. <laughs> he will do me to fix your right. A Frenchman, a Frenchman was learning English, trying to learn English. You see, sitting in a skyscraper, one of your Manhattan skyscrapers, learning English, just come from overseas, mastering English. He's mastering English grammar. And sitting near the window, he hears a shout. Look out! Look out! And he looked out, and a brick grazed him. Fortunately, he didn't die. So what's this? He said, look out. So I looked out. He says, no, the Englishman said, when you say look out, means pass up, be born, don't look out. Look in. When I say look out, means look in. Don't look out. <laughs> misunderstand. Misunderstand. You think Allah is making us to misunderstand this? No. He's warning us. Look out. Fatarabbas means look out. Means be careful. Who cares? And this is Allah's law. There is a law. Allah bari ta'ala is working according to his own law. He is not bound by any law. But there is a law. Everything according to law. There is a law that Allah puts certain honor, he gives you certain honor, certain position, certain status. And if you do not carry out your responsibilities according to that status Allah gives you, he will, as he says, yastabdil qawman khayrakum. He will substitute in your place another people. Thumma la yakunu amsalakum. Then they won't be like you. It's an eternal law. In the religious history of mankind, Allah bari ta'ala chose the Jews in the first instance. He chose the Jews, the Yahudis the Bani Israel, for his blessings. He sent prophets after prophets to them. He gave them revelation after revelation. Out of the four heavenly books, we affirm that we believe in. We say we believe in the Torah, we believe in the Zabur, we believe in the Injil, and we believe in the Furqan. Furqan is the Quran. Out of these four heavenly books, three, 75% are Jewish books. Torah sent to Hazrat Musa a Jew. Zabur given to Hazrat Dawud a Jew. Injil given to Hazrat Isa a Jew. Jew, Jew, Jew. Of all the names we give our children, you know, prophetic names, holy names, we say Musa, Dawud, Suleiman, Ishaq. These are Jewish names. Jews, Jews, Jews. We give them not because they are Jewish names, because these are the names of the righteous servants of God. Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, Hazrat Dawud alayhi salam, Hazrat Suleiman alayhi salam, Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. For that reason we give these names to our children. They are the names of the righteous servants of God. We give our children Jewish names. We believe in 75% of the books. Almost all the prophets that we know except our Nabi Akhirin were Jews, Jews, Jews. Or Jewish background. Allah chose them. Allah tells us in the Quran, Israel says, O children of Israel, remember the special favors which I did unto you. That I preferred you above all the peoples of the earth for my special favors. Allah preferred them. He chose them to become the torchbearers of his light and learning to the world. But they made the religion a racial religion. You have to be born a Jew to be a Jew. You can't become a Jew. You know that? You have to be born one to be a Jew. 
If you want to do the white man in South Africa, sometimes they fall in love with the Jewish girl, and the Jewish girl, if she's in a particular, she says, no, 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 I can't marry you unless you become a Jew. So they have to go through a process. They have to master Hebrew. They have to learn more than the rabbi, the priest. And one man, he writes in the newspaper, and at the age of 23, he says, I was painfully circumcised to become a Pakka Jew, complete. And yet he's a third grade Jew. He's still not accepted. You can go through all the process, but you're still a third grade Jew. That's why it's not for the blacks. We are blacks. I'm black in South Africa. We are not wanted at all. You black, my brother. You're not wanted at all. The Arab is black in my country. If he's a Muslim. If he's a Lebanese Christian, he's white. <laughs> Lebanese Muslim, black. Syrian Christian, white. Syrian Muslim, black. Cypriot Greek is white. Cypriot Turk, even with blonde hair and blue eyes, he's black. That's it. That's a sickness. That's besides the point. We are not discussing that. We'll talk about ourselves. So Allah Bari Ta'ala makes Hazrat Isa a Jew among the Jews to tell his people that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. This is his law. Yastabdil qawman khayrakum. You don't do your job, Allah chose us. He says, Kuntum khayra ummatin nas. You are the best of people evolved for mankind. What makes you the best of people? Because you say, I've got Arab blood in me, I'm a Pakistani, I'm a Bangladesh. What, 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 what? He says, Ta'muruna bil ma'rufi wa tanhawna nil munkar. Because you enjoy what is right and you forbid what is wrong. Wa tu'minuna billah and you believe in Allah. If these are your qualities, you are the best of people. Once the status, honor is given to you, it carries with it certain responsibilities. No honor without responsibility. Look at our Imam. He has more responsibilities than the Muazzin. The Muazzin has more responsibilities than the sweeper, the cleaner. You agree? No honor without responsibility. We are honor, khayr al-matin, the best of people. No responsibility? No, no. The responsibility is to share this deen. And if you don't, you don't do your job, it's yastabdil qawman khayrakum. Say, I will substitute in your place another people. Thumma la yakun wa msalakum. Then they won't be like you. Rubbish. They won't be like you. You don't do the job, it's a get out of the way. You rubbish. After 800 years, you didn't know anything. In India, 1,000 years the Muslims ruled India. You know that? 1,000 years. Eventually when partition takes place, the Muslim gets one quarter, the Hindu gets three quarters. Why? You didn't do the job. You are paying the price. Average of two rights a day are taking place against my people in my motherland. Average of two a day. No American will ever believe you. This fairy tale. Since sounds like a fairy tale. Two a day. Why? You didn't do the job. You still don't want to do the job. But let's listen to Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. He tells his people, and the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. One who will produce fruits, Allah will give it to them. This honor, they were the higher ummatin of the time. For thousands of years, they were the Khaira Ummati. Allah says, I'll take it away and give it to somebody else. And this is again, you know, it's an irony that whenever he takes away this privilege, this honor, and he gives to somebody else, that somebody else is the lowest in your sight. You know that? He doesn't, the one you look up to, mm -hmm, he makes the guy in the gutter, in the dust, to come and sit on your head. These pig eaters, these wine beavers, it's a right. Fix someone. These mongers, it's a Put them in the dust. Mix them up, down into the dust. <laughs> Destroyed the Muslim empire. The very same Mongols. At their hands, the barbarians, they did it to you. Allah Bari Ta'ala, when he took away, he didn't take away, the Jews lost it by their inaction. He gives it to the Arabs. And the Arabs were a people that they were looking down upon. You know that? For 3,000 years. There's a father Abraham had two wives, Sarah and Hajra. We are the children of Sarah, the legal wife, the legitimate children is Isha. And Ishmael is the son of a bond woman, a slave woman, a woman from Africa, racist that they were, a woman of Africa. Uh -huh. So these are illegitimate children. They call us Hagarines now. The Arabs, the, Jew, the Christians are calling us Hagarines, mean the children of Hagar. And Islam is no more Islam, it's Hagarism. Religion followed by the children of Hagar. The Arabs, Hagarism. This is a new name they're giving us. You know? So Allah Bari Ta'ala says, right. 
these very Hagarians. We're looking down upon them, Allah makes them to sit on their head. This is his way. This is what he does. Again and again, look. When he displaces you, he displaces you with the people who are the most despicable in your sight. This is his law to show you, so put your nose in the dust. You, I gave you 800 years. I gave you a thousand years in India. You didn't do the job, so down into the dust. He doesn't come down from his throne with a whip. So you habis, why didn't you do the job? No, no, no. He activates. He says, Lou, come on, put this guy in the dust. He's not doing his job. He does it, but he makes people to do it. And who does it? To us, the most despicable people in our side. We have our own false standards of judging people. We have, all these are false standards. We look down upon the African. My, all the people that we are all, you know, we are programmed, we are brainwashed in South Africa. You see, the African poor man, the son of the soil is at the bottom end of the ladder. The colored mixture between black and white is above him. We are above him, the Indian. Or actually, the colored is, uh, we are number two. The colored is above us because he's got some white blood in him, colored in South Africa. And the topmost is the white man. So the poor African is down at the bottom. Everybody looks down. The Indian looks down upon him, the colored looks down upon him, and the white man looks down upon him. This is how a man can behave. We are judging on account of a man's color, his lack of opportunities. So we judge him and we say he's the most low down, despicable fellow. Wait. Allah says, so you wait. You wait until Allah's decision comes about. Then he turns the tables. Our own country here, America. Who is at the bottom most end of the land? Who? Who? Come and tell me. Who? Who? Black man. See, the Arab in his mind, we said, well, this Negro. Uh, the Pakistan says, this Negro. I, I mean, no insult. You know, we have been talking about the Negroes, the Negroes, the Negroes, the Negroes, the Negro. The white man says, the Negro. The Mexican comes here, the Negro. The Negro is at the bottom most end of the ladder. He is the most despicable person in our sight. All the racist, whether Jew or Pakistani, Hindustani, Arab, we have these little bits of racism in all of us. We have it. Don't deny it. Don't say no, because I know my people. Now, man, how much we say, Innamal mu'minuna ikhwatun. So, most certainly all Muslim mu'mins are brothers. I know that, that's what I say. But in the heart of heart, there is still a bit of Hinduism in me. 5,000 years of Hindu blood is still flowing in my vein. My ancestors were Hindus. Racist. Caste system. It's there. We are programmed. Our environment, Indian, African, colored, white. Indian, African, colored, white. It's programming, brainwashing. So when I come here, I also see a, a black man at the customs. A, a shock to me. Shock. You know, this is only white man's prerogative. This, there was a time in my country that I couldn't even become a driver of this garbage vans, you know, trucks. I can't drive. That's also white man's privilege. He had to do that. He did that. I can't become a plumber. I can't become a bricklayer. I can't become an electrician. Believe me. In 1949, I took a course of radio servicing, knowing full well that when I get my diploma, I won't be able to practice it. But I did it. It was a kind of madness I had. Anything I think of, I won't do it. Now my name sounds silly. I did it, knowing that I can't practice it. Of course, it's not so now. They run short of manpower, so they give our people opportunity. My son, to become a mechanic, motor car mechanic, what a struggle. In my time, I couldn't become a motor car mechanic. It's only white men can do that. See, plumber, white man. <coughs> you know, electrician, white man. Builder, carpenter, white man. <laughs> There's nothing that I can do. I can only serve behind a counter or keep a shop or sweep the streets. That's my privilege. Same like you, I'm sure. My <laughs> Negro brother or black brother. I'm sure this was your condition here too. Maybe 50 years ago. Hmm? Right. So Allah Ta'ala says, yes, I say, here is a lesson to be learned. My wife, Muslim brother in here. Because I have come to this country since 31st of October. I am moving around from city to city. And Alhamdulillah is having a stupendous impact on the audiences. The young man, the black man, he comes and listens to me and he's enthused. The Arab, the young men, they're enthused. But as soon as we go for dinner, after my lectures in the evenings, 
I have people around me, and the Pakistani tells me, why are you interfering with the Christian? The Arab tells me, why don't you leave them alone? What do you want to debate with them for? <coughs> the Egyptian tells me that. The Syrian tells me that. The Lebanese tells me that. They want to debate with me now. Well, they, they, they're, they're making life miserable for me. You people. The only person who doesn't do that to me is the black man. Allah. He loves me and he appreciates what I'm trying to do. But the Muslim, I said, where you come from? He said, India. I says, you know, I won't say those figurative words, but the Hindu has got you. You know that? You are an emasculated person, castrated animal. My brother, I'm talking to him. I say, you are a castrated animal. You can't even cry in that country. You know that? We are 120 million Muslims in India, and you can't even cry to the Hindus. So what are you hitting us for? A handful of six compared to us. Indira Gandhi was bending backwards to appease them. Ma, this Rajiv Gandhi has given them everything except independence. They are a handful, they are 12 million, we are 120 million, and 120 million you can't even cry. You telling me what to do? You have a right to judge me as to what I'm doing? No, I says you. You are like a castrated animal, ready for slaughter. You Egyptians. He says, I'm an Egyptian. I say, yeah. You Egyptian. I said, the six million cops has got you. You can do nothing, man. You are 40 million, you can't implement the Sharia. You know that? You talking to me? You Lebanese? I said, you talking to me? You Syrian? I said, Assad has got you too. What are you talking about? You cowards. No, no. He says, this, this, what has happened to you? Allah is telling you in the Quran what I read to you. He said, look, what are your considerations? Your fathers? Your brothers? Your wives? Your relations? What? Yeah, maybe you have a white woman as a wife, you haven't yet converted her. Or if you have your brother-in-laws and your sister-in-laws are Christians and you want to appease them, is that your consideration? The nice life, comfortable life that you are having, that is your consideration. Your wealth, your businesses, is that your consideration? Allah is asking you. Sa'ahabu ilaykum min Allahi. If you love any one of these things more than you love Allah, Rasulihi and loving his Rasul, whatever he tells you to do, you don't want to do. Wa Rasulihi wa jihadin fi sabilihi and doing jihad in Allah's way. What is jihad? What is jihad? You can't even open your mouth. And you want to keep battle. Allah promises you, li yuzi hirahu aladdin kulli. He's given you a deen that should master, overcome and supersede them all. Bulldoze them all. Kulli. And again the same formula, he said, Now the Mushriks might not like it. Then he repeats the same formula again in the Quran. He says, He it is who has sent his messenger with guidance, al-haq, and with the religion of truth, that it may prevail, overcome, and supersede every other deen, every other way of life, whether it be Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianism, Communism, Judaism, every ism. Islam is destined to master them all, bulldoze them all. And enough is Allah is a witness to this fact that he's going to make his deen to prevail with you or without you. But you rubbish, you think Allah is waiting on you. He's depending on you. It's only a privilege he's giving you and me. Rubbish that we are to serve his deen. To do a prophet's job and earn a prophet's reward. If you won't do it, don't. Don't worry. You are already gone. We lost two million Arabs in America. In the past hundred years, we lost them. Two million Arabs. Most of we lost them. They came here, married this white woman, and they became westernized. You know, started shaking the bums. He started eating pigs, you know, drinking alcohol. Two million we lost. This new generation, inshallah, it is not so. But the spirit, the spirit, that militancy is gone out of you. For earthly mess, a mess of pottage, for a good job, for this nice comfortable living. So Allah is telling you that you love these things, your, your, your dwellings in which you take delight, your businesses, these are your considerations. He says, you wait, فَتَرَبَّسُوا You wait, hatta يَأْتِيَ اللَّهُ بِأَمْرِ Till Allah's decision comes about for your destruction. My brothers and my sisters, I said, please don't wait. Wallah, Allah doesn't want you to wait. He wants you to wake up, get up, and help our black brothers, lift them up, and Allah, I can see the signs that they will do the job. Not we. We have worn out people. You know, Muslims from Bangladesh and Pakistan and Egypt and the Middle East, I say, you, we are a worn out people. We have aged now, aged. Thousand years we are Muslims. 
you age gone old, rotten, discrepant, your bones are creaking. You are waiting, all, waiting also for destruction. Yes, you have no right. You have no right to judge. I tell you, you have no right whatsoever. If there is anybody who can judge, he has a right, I say, this is my black brother. He has a right to judge. And I tell you, he's judging right. He has got it. Allah has given it to him. You know that? He's the only guy who can stand up before the white American. This Texan, eight-foot giant. He can stand before him and talk to him in his own language, in his own slang, and beat him at his own game. So with these words, my dear brother, let us pray to Allah, that may he, you know, if we haven't got that militancy, at least we have that, that sense, that patience to keep our big mouth shut. If you can't do the job, keep quiet. Let the others do the job. Don't come in their way. Why are you doing this and why are you doing that? Because you are not fit to judge anybody. Wa akhirul da'wana. Alhamdulillah. Barakallah fi brother Ahmad Didad. Inshallah, before we start our session with questions and answers, I'd like to make just one little comment that we, al Muslimun, alhamdulillah, in this area and especially in this masjid, regardless of our race, regardless of our color, regardless of our background, we are trying, trying hard, inshallah, to extend our hands to each other, to love each other, to work together for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'd like to remind you all, also, me and myself, that today, alhamdulillah, millions of people all over the world are celebrating the birthday of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Mawlul Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I believe our gathering here, alhamdulillah, is considered one of the best way to celebrate the seerah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among his companions in the hereafter, inshallah, and in Jannah. Before we start our questions, I'd like to start with one of the questions which came to my mind, if you, if you permit me, inshallah. I have watched a couple uh, videotapes for Brother Ahmad Didan. As I said at the beginning, he is very well known with his debates with the non-Muslims. From his own experience, I'd like him to advise me as a regular Muslim who has limited knowledge. When I talk to the non-Muslims, what should I do? That's number one. Number two, what's his advice to those brothers who have more knowledge when they get in a, an argument with the non-Muslims related to Al-Islam or the other beliefs? Barakallahu feek. See, Allah bari ta'ala, when he confers upon us that honor of being the khayra ummatin, the best of people, that is only half a verse. And everybody quotes half a verse. كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ النَّاسِ تَعْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَتَنْحَوْنَ لِلْمُنْكَرِ وَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ Full stop. Everybody you listen to, you find he stops at وَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ Nobody completes a verse. We are also like the Christians. They quote half a verse and they expound a religion. They say, as is, um, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Full stop. Where there is no full stop. They put a full stop and they start expounding. We do the same. We say, what do Billah? And who believe in Allah? Full stop. So the question is, look, why do you interfere with the Christians? So I said, look, the answer is in the second half of the verse. Allah says, وَلَوْ آمَنَ أَحْلُ الْكِتَابِ لَكَانَ خَيْرُ لَهُمْ But if the people of the book, meaning the Jews and the Christians, if they hearken to this message, the Quran, it will be better for them. In other words, it will be better for you. These people are the fittest people, Allah says. They are prepared to receive the message. The Jews and the Christians are prepared to receive the message. And you are not sharing it with them. وَلَوْ آمَنَ أَحْلُ الْكِتَابِ لَكَانَ خَيْرُ لَهُمْ مِنْهُمُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Among them there are mu'mins. Something that I don't want to say. I feel hard in saying that among the Jews and the Christians there are mu'mins. Good people. Sincere people. Faithful people. Honest people, among them Allah says. Wa aktharumul fasikum. But the majority of them are perverted transgressors. Two times. There is a goodly guy there among the Jews and the Christians. If I had time, I'd deliver a lecture on that. Especially tonight, if I was here, I would have spoken of if they gave me a chance, Muhammad the greatest. And I show you our Nabi Akram Sarasar. Mouths of the Jews and the Christians, what they say about our Nabi. Which we are afraid to utter. Greatness which they confer upon our Nabi, which we are terrified to utter. Oh, in this New York city of yours. This is New York. I forget where I am, you see. I'm, I'm living in a life, a dream world, you see. This is New York. There's a hard publishing company here. 
Michael H. Hart, he has written a book, The Top 100. The 100, the top 100, the greatest 100 in history. He gives a list of 100 great names. Most influential men from Hazrat Adam alayhi salam up to current times. Then he puts them in the order of importance, seniority. And he says, number one, so and so. Number nine, so and so. Ninety-nine, so and so. And in his list, he puts our Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi salam. Muhammad, number one. Did you know that? In your city here. I purchased the book for $15 about five years ago. $15, 572 pages. You know? What, what makes him to say that? We have to analyze when we have time one day. Times Magazine, July 15, 1974. Series of essays under who are history's great leaders? Different people give their views according to their standards of judging. Among them there is Jules Masserman, a United States psychoanalyst, a professor of the Chicago University. He puts our Nabi Akram himself as the number one, Muhammad. The greatest leader of all time, Muhammad. And to a lesser extent, he says, whatever Muhammad did, he said Moses did the same. His hero, number two. This Christian here, Muhammad, number one. His God and Savior, number three. No, you, you, you. I say, you are terrified to say that. That Muhammad is the greatest man that ever lived. Allah is not ashamed. He said, Wa inna kala ala khulukin azim. He said, most certainly thou, Muhammad, stand us on the highest pinnacle of behavior. Allah testifies the enemies, Jews and Christians, they testify, but you are suffering from an inferiority complex. You will not say that Muhammad is the great. I know you won't come out of your mouth. I have experience in that. So Allah says in the Quran, among the Jews and the Christians, there are good people. So there are two different types of customers. Now I will show you one way, like the good Jew or the good Christian. Let's take the good Christian. Open the Quran. Tell him, speak to him, he says, you know we believe in Jesus. He says, yes. Many shop amazed. Maybe he's thinking you're trying to curry favor with him. You're trying to get something out of him. Maybe a cigarette or something else. What? He says, you know we believe in Jesus. He says, yes. He says, you know what the Quran says? He says, no. Start. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ya so behold, the angel said, O Mary, inna Allah astafaki wa tahharaki wa astafaki ala nisa al alameen. That God Almighty has chosen thee and purified thee, chosen thee above the women of all nations. Maryam, the mother of Jesus, Allah says in the Quran, is a woman chosen above the women of all nations. I said, now explain. This such an honor is not to be found given to Mary, the mother of Jesus, even in the Christian Bible. We have a surah in the Quran called Surah Maryam, in chapter Mary, in honor of the name of the mother of Jesus Christ. There is no such book. They have 66 books of the Protestants in the Bible and 73 of the Roman Catholics. There is not a book called Maryam Mary. You know that? Look, doctor, this is the good guy. The perverted transgressor, I said, now nah, I show you, I have my books. Get them. Free, Allah free. And I'm telling people here in America, why don't you reproduce them? Something wrong with the mentality. You sick, emasculated people, I'm telling you. They write to me, this book of mine is the Bible God's Word. I get a letter from one of the big societies here. He says, you know, your book is a bit too militant. So I said, all right, change it. You, Allah. I said, look, you got the basics there. If you want to change some words, in case I swore somebody, you know, I use raw, uncouth, barbaric language because I'm not educated. I didn't go to a university. I'm a layman, a furniture salesman. I've been talking, talking, and talk myself into this. <laughs> so, so I said, look, I know you, you are educated. You have the training, you know, psychology, philosophy, all this you learn, methods. I said, now you improve it. Five years, ten years gone now, they haven't done it yet. So what is excuses? Excuses for not doing the work. Christ in Islam. Trump, really he says, crucifixion of crucifixion, who moved the stone, what was the sign of Jonah, all of our publications are addressed to the Christian mentality. You, if you want to do the job, there is no way, I tell you, there is no other way. My secretary passed this way and he said, well, this is one of the ways. I said, you know, there is no other way if you want to do that. With the Jews and the Christians, you have to read my books. There is no copyright. Go and reproduce it. Sell it. Do what you like. But you can't help. If you want to do the job, I tell you there is no other way. You have got to use my words. What for? Because 40 years I am in the field. I am in the battlefield for 40 years. 
Our brothers have acquired knowledge. Hadith, Quran. I take off my hand. Alhamdulillah. So now, the perverted transgressor. One way is the good man should Islam. Beauty is Islam. Talk to him about our teachings. Talk to him about our life, our behavior, our culture. You know we are the most hygienic people in the world. Most hygienic people. Unfortunately, we are tied down with the Americanized way of life. You see, we have a saying that when you tie a horse to a donkey, you know, horse, you tie with a donkey, the horse can't bray like a donkey, but it lifts up his head, trying to behave like a donkey. That's we. In this environment, you're behaving like donkeys. In your hygiene. You know, I go to a house costing about half a million dollars. There's no water facility in the toilet, do you know that? Half a million dollars when there's not a can in the toilet, you know that? Yes, I don't know. This is a big spoozy, what that, you know that spoozy part. I said, you mean to say every time you go along and you release yourself, you go into spoozy? Huh? Nothing. Two toilets in the house, top and bottom. I go to the top one, no water. I go to the bottom, no water. No water facility. I say, you see, you become a donkey. You don't become a donkey, you're still a Muslim. See, but you behave like a donkey. Our hygiene, Islamic hygiene, the topmost hygiene in the world. When we go for number one, we wash. When we go for number two, we wash. As a married man, you come together with your wife, a complete bath from head to toe. Otherwise, we won't go to the mosque. We don't take the Quran. Did you know that? I'm telling you, this missionary has come to me, arguing, debating with me. He said, what has Muhammad done for you? The man says, you know, Christ did this for me. I was a drunkard, I don't drink anymore. I was a gambler, I don't gamble anymore. I was promiscuous, you know. I was a sodomite, a gay. I'm not a gay anymore. He says, congratulations to you. <laughs> That's good. You were in the gutter, you came out, congratulations. Now he's asking me, what has Muhammad done for you? And that's not a question. That is a criticism. A carping criticism. In other words, he's saying, Muhammad has done nothing for you. That's the implication of the question. What has Muhammad done for you if he has done nothing for you? What can I do? I had to hit him with a sledgehammer. This intellectual one. <laughs> Not the other one, the I can be charged. So I said, you know, you, you nice, clean, shaven, immaculate. Immaculately dressed. I said, had it not been for the suit that you're wearing, I could have mistaken you for maidens. I did like, you know, like young girls. I could have mistaken you. know, you look like women. But only this clothing tells me that you are men. Mm -hmm. But I said, you know, my underarm is as clean as your chin, and I rubbed it hard. There. It says, you know, this is clean like that. Oh, you big creature. I says, clean as that. Muhammad taught me hygiene. In a country where there's no water, he made me water conscious. Any excuse, every excuse, water, water, water. But you have lost it. Here in America, you have lost it. The people have lost it. You are behaving like donkeys in every aspect of your life. I see. Problems, problems for me. Of course, you don't care for old men like me. So I says, you have drifted away. What the Arabs taught us 200, 400 years ago, hygiene. We are carrying it out, but the Arab has forgotten it. Believe me, I'm not trying to run my brothers down. What for? I'm there, traveling from Medina to Makkah in an air-conditioned bus in the Ahram. And I see these students that have come from America, Arab students. And they had come from Germany, came from France, and we all in Ihram, we're going to Makkah from Medina, my bus. The Wami conference, they called us and they're now taking us. And in the bus, while we are talking in the Ihram, I see everybody has got beards under the arm. <laughs> the Arabs! So I'm asking, what is this? Is that, you know, is that I have a chance, you know, I was supposed to. Was, so what's wrong with you? No, no. He's forgotten. Wallah, I tell you, he's forgotten. You see, we have to teach you back what your forefathers taught me. Now I'm coming to teach you. And I know it's an offense. This new convert telling us, and this new convert, Wallah, these black brothers of ours, they're going to teach us. Wallah, they will have to teach you. Say, hey, look, whatever. Is this Islamic? Is this Islamic? Are you pure? Are you clean with this condition you have come? The conditions, you know, the gymnastics you have to do to get into the toilet and to use the water. Gymnastic, you have to be a gymnast. What's wrong with you? No, look, you can create an industry, wallah, to meet our needs. We did it in South Africa. You know, uh, I, won't, I won't waste your time. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I've got off the head. I got over enthusiastic. Please forgive me. Yes, brother. Yes, um, I sound like.
I saw a flyer a couple weeks ago that you had debated a uh, Christian, a uh, renowned Christian uh, scholar, man, who was here, Louis Swag. I just want to know um, how did it turn out and did you have a good turnout for this? Alhamdulillah, there were about five to 6,000 people turned up for the meeting. Mostly they were Christians. Mostly they were the hero worshippers of Jimmy Swaggart. He's a mighty man. He's the greatest evangelist that Christianity has produced in this century, in this age. Today, there is nobody greater than him. You know, his writings, his speeches, charismatic. He can, he can move people to ecstasy and tears. He can make people to eat out of his hands. He's great. But truth was on our side. That's the only advantage we have. You see, truth is on our side. And Allah says, بَلْ نَجْزِفُ بِالْحَقِّ عَلَى الْبَاطِلِ فَيَذُ مَغَبُوا فَازَهُ وَسَاحِقُونَ وَلَكُمُ الْوَيْلُ مِمَّا تَسِفُونَ So when truth is heard against falsehood, it knocks out its brain. This is, Alhamdulillah, thing. you should try and get the tape, the video tape, you'll enjoy it. Inshallah, you'll enjoy it. And it's historical and you will be able to, you know, for your children and your children's children, as long as the tape is going, it will be doing a job. How do you deal with the disregard that the Christian has to the Quran if you want to use the Quran as the basis of guiding them? Now, this is the type of a sick person. See, when you want to talk about the Quran, you say, what is this? We say, this is the revelation of God. So we, who, 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 who received it? We say, Muhammad. Ah, he has so many wives. You know, he spread his religion at the point of the sword. The Quran was copied from the Jews and the Christians. Now, that is the perverted transgressor. Leave the Quran on one side. Put it on the shelf. Don't bring it into the battlefield. Use his own book, the Bible. And Allah is telling you, Kul hatu Whenever he makes a claim, whatever claims he makes, Allah says, Kul hatu he says, he says, produce your proof, your evidence. In kuntum sadiqeen. And once he produces it, use my book. My books will teach you what to do with the fellow. With his Bible. Inshallah. Yes, ma'am. Next, next to the... Assalamu alaikum. You know, uh, Christian has this thing of uh, Jesus Christ uh, being on the cross as a pipe. I noticed how a lot of Muslims all over the world look up to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They kind of look to Prophet Muhammad more up than they look to the dean as far as you know Prophet Muhammad's birthday. Whereas now instead of having Jesus Christ, it seems like he's shifting towards uh, Muhammad as being an Arab, more so as being a righteous prophet of Allah. And uh, I want to speak on the right or wrong on that because it seems like he's trying to equate since Christian lift up Jesus Christ as being a God, a child of God. The Muslims seem like you're picking up Muhammad instead of picking up what Allah says, instead of picking up the Quran. And uh, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, I don't see like, you know, if I speak on, like today, uh, I suppose you talk Muhammad first. Right. What uh, about the revelation of what Allah gave to talk Muhammad? Right. 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 Now, what do we do, you see, when we celebrate his birthday? We are reminding ourselves about his life, how he sacrificed everything <coughs> for this Kalamullah, for Allah's Kalam. He had to flee for his life. Now, if these things are not an inspiration for us, that look, this man of God, he is no God. He is not the son of God. He is only a messenger. He is telling you so. He is made to say that again and again. Saqul, tell them, Inna basharun mithlukum. Say, I am a man like yourself. You ha'ilayya, but the revelation of God has come to me. Inna Allah ilahu wahid, that your Allah is one Allah. This is it. Tell them that if they love Allah, فَاتَّبِعُونِي He says, follow me, يُحْبِبْكُمُ Allah, Then Allah will love you. وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ And He'll forgive you your sins. Right? So if you love Allah, you have to love the Prophet. If you can't love the one you can see, how can you love the one you can't see? So this man, he sacrifices all. We're reminding ourselves about his life, that we may also emulate his life. And that's what Allah is telling us. He said, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةً حَسَنَا So most certainly, in the Apostle of Allah, you have the best exemplar. So we are not substituting Muhammad for Jesus. He said, look, you're worshipping Jesus, now we're going to worship Muhammad. Astaghfirullah. No Muslim does that. If somebody does, we have to rectify it. But I can't imagine a Muslim worshipping the Holy Prophet Muhammad. 
Five times a day the Muazzin is telling you, Ashadu anna Muhammad al-Rasulullah. Said, I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. He is not God. He is not his son. Don't make a mistake like the others have done. They made the prophets into God. They made the heroes into God. Don't you do that. And that message has gone home. No Muslim worships Muhammad. Even the most lunatic of us. We have lunatics too, you know that? <laughs> we have types and types of lunacies we have. Among us, among us here, this group. Allah, if everybody had a chance to get at me, I will find the lunacies. But Alhamdulillah, I think after this, they'll be taking me away. Yes. <laughs> Right, the English, the English, the English. Right, right. And he gave the book into a, a coffin's hand to read it because he wants it. Right. See, the answer is yes. But our brethren, the more learned of us, they say, La yamasuhu illal say, None shall touch it except those that are pure. Accept it. You and I, when you are in a condition of janabat, you know, impurity, ceremonial impurity, you and I have no right to touch the Qur'an because we are bound by a constitution. That constitution tells us that we must be under certain conditions before you touch it. What about the non-Muslim? So he said, now they are not bound by our constitution. The moment they read the kalima, they'll also be bound. Until then, they are free. The man shows sincerity, that is his, his purity. He wants to know. He says, I want to see your book. You can't say, no, 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 no. You see, a man comes to a shop, you want to buy a car, he said, look, you buy, if you want to know about the car, you buy the car first. You'll buy a car or any, any, anything. He said, look, you buy it first and then you find out. No, no, no. He said, I want to know what you're selling. Now, these brothers of ours, mostly from Pakistan and India, they are talking like that. So I said, ask them the question. You see, there are six million cops in Egypt. What translation will you give them? Ask them. What translation? Chinese? Zulu? What are you going to give them? The Arabic Quran, the Lebanese Christian, what, what translation will you give them? Tell me, ask them, what translation? Our Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know he wrote those letters to the Emperor of Persia, the Emperor of Constantinople, the King of Egypt, the King of Yemen and the Nagas of Abyssinia. Five letters he sent out before his demise. Five letters were sent out. And each and every letter began, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. The first verse of the Quran. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most gracious. And right in the middle of the letter to Heraclius, the Emperor Constantinople, there's another verse of the Quran. I saw it with my own eyes in the Top Kabi Museum in Istanbul. It says, Khul, say, Ya Halal Kitab, O people of the book, Ta'ala, come, Ila Kalimatin Sawaim, Bainana wa Bainakum, that we come to common terms as, as between us and you. Allah na buda illallah, that we worship not but Allah, wala no shirika bihi shay'an, and that we associate no partners with him, wala yattakhidha ba'dun abadun arbaadun min dunillah, and that we do not take from among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. Fa in tawallaw, fa kulu shadu bi anna muslimun, but if they turn back, tell them that we are Muslims. We have submitted our wills to the will of God. Two verses in one letter, and when the messenger went, one horse, one ashab, Sahaba, and one scroll. He was not told that when you go and give this letter, ask the fellow that whether, you know, he made ghusl, to go and tell him to make wudu and come. No. He said, give it with all due respect. So, this is the example set by our Nabi. He sent out the letters with Allah's kalam. If it was good enough for him, it's good enough for me. If Allah is going to question me, he'll have to question his Rasul. So, I'm in good company. You are in good company. You give. I said, look, if he, Allah is going to choke you up, he'll have to choke up his rasul. He'll have to do the same thing. He's got to be judged. I said, no. This, what you are talking about is that heart, you see, your responsiveness. You have a clean heart, only you will get the maximum benefit. Otherwise, even Abu Jahl, his reading, his understanding, his listening, is doing no good for him. See, he's unclean. No matter how many baths he had. Yes, my brother. Um, first of all, it's an honor to be here. Uh, these are the uh, men who take the written books 
And uh, I'm very, very impressed. Uh, my question is this. Uh, in talking to Christians and uh, in seeing people talk to Christians, they always have uh, certain uh, pack escape routes once they're coined, once they're thoroughly defeated. Uh, one thing they'll say is that it's all a big mystery. Nobody can understand it. The reason is not important. But it's something that's uh, totally unbelievable that merit and believe the unbelievable. Another escape route they'll take is that uh, they had an experience. They talked to Jesus. Jesus talked to them. You know, uh, I was interested in, in seeing what uh, Jimmy Swagger's response was because I, you know, without even knowing what happened, I wasn't there. I knew it was going to be, you know, and uh, sure enough, he said that uh, he had an uh, experience, God talking to him, pouring his spirit out. He talked about some other woman who was talking in tongues, some of the stuff, you know. Uh, this is always a movie take another uh, popular idea uh, in America is that it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter uh, what God you believe in, even when it's been proven that, you know, Islam is true. As long as you're a good person and you're good inside, you do good deeds, you're all right. How do you respond to this? These are all now, it calls for a series of lectures. What you have now suggested, and these are available on videotape, on cassettes, and in books. You get them and you use them. Everything is covered, inshallah. Then, this experience I'm telling, this swagat thing. Get it. Then I had with Dr. Robert Douglas had another debate. Get it in Kansas City. You see, get these things. They are entertaining. Wallah, you will enjoy it. The entertainment part of it, as well as the educational part of it, okay? and you will get addicted to it if you are not afraid. Yes, brother. Uh, just recently, after you had a debate with Swagger, Swagger has a program that comes on in the morning on TV. And uh, he, he's been given reference to Islam. We've been mentioning about Muslims on the different program. And he had mentioned about the Bible. And he said that the Bible contains so many prophecies. And that's, that's the way they verify that this is the word of God and so forth. And he mentioned the Quran. He said the Quran, he doesn't know anything about it having any kind of prophecy whatsoever. <coughs> the point is, uh, I would like to know what your response would be if, in fact, you had that debated on that issue. But I'm, I'm curious to know what was your response to be in that. You must get the tape again. He made an open apology. He said, look, I had made certain statements in ignorance. I didn't know. And I apologized unconditionally. And he said, I will not repeat the words. Just to tell you, some of you might not have heard. But he said, now you repeated the words, his words. He says, I will not repeat the words. Truly Islamic spirit. I guess it must have been about two years ago now, I made a derogatory statement over television about the Quran. If you were not listening that particular week, I'm never going to tell you what it was. I have a lot of community here, and this is the Yes. They are in the Bible and they come to the argument they give Right. But there comes a stage when they say, well, Jesus came out three days after that, and they give a dogma in their mind. Right. So they, they, after that, they keep smiling. Oh. After they don't proceed, they know that the order is there, but after that, they eat the matter. Right. And they say before that, they don't get there. Right. How to meet that situation? No, that all of this is where you lead him off from there. You see, it's, it's so easy, Wallah, it is so easy. If you just know a little bit about his book, you have to master that. Then you quote him from his own book. He says, you know when Jesus returned to that upper room where they had the Last Supper after his alleged crucifixion? He said, yes, he knows. I said, he comes in and wishes his disciples, Shalom Alaikum, in Hebrew, same as Salam Alaikum. I said, his disciples were terrified. Why were they terrified? So his book says they were affrighted because they thought he was a ghost. A spirit, a spook. So I'm at, learn to ask, did he look like a spook? They said no. So why should they think the man is a ghost when he doesn't look like a ghost? However, if you know, then I tell them, I say, Jesus tries to prove to them that he's not what they're thinking. So he says, Unzuru ila yadayya varijadayya. He says, behold my hands and my feet. Inni anabua, that it is I myself. I'm the same fellow man, damn fools, what are you afraid of me for? So Husuri Wanzuru, handle me and see. Fine Ruha Laisalahu Lahmu Maizam. For a spirit has no flesh and bones, as you see we have. Simple, basic English. I'm asking Dr. Robert Douglas, when the man tells you a spirit has no flesh and bones. So I want you to tell your audience that in your language, when you say a spirit has no flesh and bones, it means a spirit has flesh and bones. Tell them, and I will accept it. He couldn't, he did. Look, 
that means you have to master these little things. And inshallah, you do the job. Barakallahu feek, Brother Ahmad Didan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you who spend this time, this wonderful time with us, learning some of our Islamic uh, teaching, inshallah. After we make us, uh, like before we make the Adhan, inshallah, I'd like to remind you that by next Friday, inshallah, I'll be able to get from the brothers some information about the video tapes for Brother Ahmad Didan and we'll make the announcement, inshallah, next Friday, how can you acquire them? the video clips or the cassettes. By next Friday, inshallah, I'll make the announcement here in this message, inshallah. Allah, Allah.